Hi there, I'm Michael Hill with Canine Chronicle TV, and I'm excited to have Maddie McHugh of Indian Bend English Setters here with us for our next installment of Next Gen, and we're gonna be focusing on getting to know the younger generation of the sport of purebred dogs. Maddie is here with us from Bonita, California. How are you, Maddie? I'm great, thank you for having me. It's our pleasure. So why don't we get started about how you just got into dogs in the first place? I think you were born into it in a way with family already in dogs. I started in English setters with my grandmother. Um, since I was about three years old, I've been going to shows with her, dragging around her puppies, socializing. So I've just grown up and lived through English setters and now have worked for several handlers with Bruce and Tara Schultz currently. So love that and so what um was it something that from the beginning you kind of saw this was something you wanted to do or was it just your it's all you knew at that time so it started as all that i knew but i can't remember a time where i didn't love climbing into the whelping box helping whelp puppies and the older i got the more it just kind of stuck to me like i love doing this and i love yeah. yes the breeding aspect of it but the care for all of the animals that i've experienced and just growing and learning with all of these people that have tons of experience and knowledge to share. Mm. It's just more and more become something that I know that I love to do. I love that. And, and I think it's interesting too, because you have that component of also being involved in the companion dog industry, right? With Bruce and Tara and their boarding kennel. Um, you know, what, what are some things that you've learned in particular with um, that current situation um, that maybe you didn't know before going to work with handlers and kind of seeing the business side of things outside of dog shows? So I've worked for several handlers that have different ways of running their business, right? Everyone's going to run their business a different way. I will say the pet industry, the um, with the boarding kennels on that side of it, the daycare, they really are prioritized on the care of their animals. And that is something that is super important. And I think that a lot of us in the dog world are very good at, but yeah. it can also be taken for granted as well. Um, but I do know that I'm trying to find a way to, to explain this because, because I'm going to say dog people is a general in the show community are, much more pressured on appearance and especially in the grooming aspect because Tara and I, we actually took up and replaced our pet groomer for a little while. And it is so different. I mean, yeah. we would, we would take twice as long because we wanted Fluffy's hair to be perfect every little which way. Right. And the owner is like, shave it shorter. <laughs> right, right, right. They're like, I so just it was such a, it. <laughs> it's so foreign. And you know, the business yeah. aspect of it, I'm very fortunate to have not known what it's like not to run a dog, a handling business like a business. Mm. So I think this just kind of solidifies the fact that as handlers, we do need to make sure that this is run like a business through the proper channels. And that's something that I wholeheartedly believe in. And it makes it easier on us, especially during times like the pandemic where you know, maybe we are losing our source of income, but we are, you know, a licensed business practice versus, you know, being paid through a PayPal or under right. the table. Right. No, that's a really great point. And I think like, you know, this year is a great kind of uh, litmus test for how that plays yes. out when you are looking at, you know, government interventions and, and support systems that are out there. And I think also like, I'd love to talk about some other businesses, because I know you're involved in the makeup industry as well. Tell us how you got into that and how that's been able to kind of complement the dog aspect of things during a weird year like this. Yeah, so I actually, um, a friend came to me. She had started in the, you know, became an artist with this makeup company. And I wanted to be supportive. And I wasn't, like, I am not, despite everything that, you know, you may think, I am not this big, giant, girly girl that, needs to be pretty all of the time. Like, let me tell you, if I don't have to wear makeup, I'm not wearing it. <laughs> <laughs> it's more so work. <laughs> it, it's, it's a lot of work and I'd rather just not. Um, yeah. But no, I truly love the products that I'm using, but it came to the point where my heart dog had to have emergency surgery. Mm. And it was one of those, you know what? I'm very fortunate to still have a job. I love that I am still working, but this could be fun to get, you know, my head out of dogs and get myself kind of out of my own head, if that makes sense. Yeah. 
Yeah, and just so even this was perspective something, from another world. Yeah, exactly. And it was just something that I was doing for myself to make myself feel good. Yeah. And, you know, kind of support and pay those, you know, how crazy vet bills can get when you know a heart dog, you're like, do everything you can. Right. right. Tell me so, the number after. <laughs> yeah. Like just take my card and use it. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I, so, I mean, I spent my entire life savings, saving my own dog. And I decided yeah. that, you know what, I have nothing left to lose. I'm pretty good, you know, with makeup and stuff if I want to be. So yeah. I decided that that was going to be something that I did for myself. And it is so rewarding Mm. to help people and women in particular feel beautiful without piling like a ton of stuff on their face. And that's why I believe yeah. in the certain products that I have. I um, that. But it just, it gets you out of your own head and you get so laser focused on the dog sometimes that it's just not healthy for your own personal and mental health. You need something yeah. that gets you out of that, like, that headspace. Totally. Because I think, you know, the, the double-edged sword of a passion is that it can consume you and that we have to take active steps to protect mental and physical health from burnout. And I think dog handlers, as a rule, push the limit on that on a regular basis compared to somebody who goes to a nine-to-five job with a hard, fast endpoint. You know, when you guys are on the road with these dogs, it's 24 seven and they're living, breathing things that you can't, you know, control what's going to happen. So, um, you know, I think it's also, again, even with like a pandemic that can dramatically affect shows and events like mm -hmm. that. It's all, like you said, just the financial, you know, security system to be diversified and not have all your eggs in that same basket. Yeah, for sure. So. And I think that way you're not totally devastated if you're losing something in a situation like this pandemic you're not all consumed by uh, my life is over because my passion is at a halt you know my sport is not doing well because there are no dog shows right. i think it's something that it was great to keep and shift focus because i do still work with dogs every single day but it was great to be able to shift that focus when i needed a breather and I think yeah. having an outlet for anyone, whether it's photography, which I have done some or graphic design or um, painting or whatever your, you know, your artistic outlet, I think it's really important for someone to have that outside of their passion because it's a good release. Yeah, absolutely. And it on, uh, kind of helps you um, refuel so that you can actually do your passion better. Exactly. I and I that's agree so with that important. wholeheartedly. Let's go back to the dogs um, in particular, because you've had the pleasure of working with Bruce and Tara, who have had some huge winning dogs in a lot mm -hmm. of different breeds. Um, you know, and then you have your own dogs that you've bred and showed. What are some of the highlights or your favorite memories or experiences? Thus far? Oh, there are so many that I can't even count. Um, I will say probably with my own dogs, I'll start with my own dogs. Going to Morris and Essex back in 2015 with my English setter that I basically dropped everything for a year just to try and give her the credit that she deserved and, you know, campaign her. Mm -hmm. So it kind of was those, you know, I'm going to go and I'm probably not going to win, but it's just good to experience that. So I go and sure. Lorraine Biso is judging English setters and it started to rain and everyone is there and she pulls me and she pulls Eileen Hackett out with this stunning dog that she was showing. Yeah. I mean, just beautiful. And yeah. she made it this, she pulled us both out. She made it this huge contest and pulled me to the front. And I think my jaw just dropped and like my heart sank. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, that was just incredible alone. But my favorite part of that is Eileen and Kate were my ride to the national the next week. So we immediately got in the car together and drove to the national and just had an amazing week. So, I mean, I think it just shows how strong that community is. Um, Absolutely. And that's probably my favorite all time, but being there for Shay Skinner, when Shay had the first best in show winning black Sharpay bitch, that mm. was an incredible memory um going to the garden and having tiffany place third with the schnauzer and then going through everything that i've been with with bruce and tara i think everything with them has just been more memorable on top on top mm -hmm. of that 
Mm. And I mean, there's no specific memory that I can point out because everything is just so incredible. Yeah, it seems like you guys have a real solid teamwork where you guys kind of are a whole organization, you know, whether it's training puppies or getting, you know, top specials in the group. <laughs> you kind of yeah. see you guys all as a group. <laughs> I mean, and we are, we're a great team, but I mean, really, I've become family. And a funny story about that is um, Bruce actually showed my grandmother's English setters, her first dogs, Irish setters, actually, before she had English over 25 years ago. Wow. So it's really so just it, come full circle. It goes circle. far back. <laughs> it goes way far that. back to like before I was even born. That is fantastic. I did not know that. That's really, I mean, and you know, that's like, I think something that's very unique about a sport like this, that you do have those kind of like personal relationships that become so intertwined to these professional relationships and feed each other. Yes. You know, you wouldn't have one without the other. Um, you know, on that topic, for somebody who is um, younger or new to the sport, how do you feel, um, you know, the, the opportunities are at this time in the sport for somebody to get involved that hasn't grown up in the sport or that doesn't have those um, pre-existing connections? Do you think there are things that we can do to make that experience more appetizing? Um, or do you think we do it well? Or what are your thoughts on that? I think that overall as a sport, I do think that we do it well. Um, breeders as a whole do know what specific handlers in a breed for newcomers that have decided mm -hmm. to get their first show dog. I do think that overall we do that well. I think that handlers are very approachable for the most part in saying like, if I'm a new person and I walk up to somebody and say, hey, can you help me with Fluffy? Yeah. Or can you help me with my new dog? I really really would like to learn. And yeah. I think a lot of handlers are just so ready to teach yeah. that I think that's something that I would say is really doing well. But good. I've experienced it myself. So I agree there. And I think, it, you know, it's, it's one of those things that people sometimes don't even realize that all they have to do is ask. And there are lots of people who are <laughs> more than happy to share what they have with people. Um, well, and you know, sometimes and the most intimidating, sometimes the most intimidating handlers are the most approachable. And it is mm. so amazing to watch someone actually approach them and everything just softens and it is just yeah. magical to watch. Yeah, that's a, I think that's a really great point is like we can't judge them by their working mode when they're outside the group doing their job. You no. know, it has to do with approaching them at the right time and being open and honest and willing to listen as opposed yes. to <laughs> coming in threatened and, you know, coming at somebody, I think is, is just really important. Um, speaking, we've mentioned, of, you know, Bruce, Tara, um, you know, Tiffany and Shay, are there any other particular people in dogs that made an impact on you and your kind of upbringing and, and growth of your career? I will say yes, absolutely. So I, the first handler that I lived with was Shay and Tiffany and I learned leaps and bounds. I learned mountains from them. And then I worked for Andy Linton and I learned so much and he has so much to offer the world and the sport yeah. itself. I mean, it was just an incredible learning experience. And so he's mm. one that I've learned so much from and that I yeah. admire a whole heck of a lot. Yeah. I love that. He's a, a wonderful dog person and so, so, so talented. And also one of those people who's willing to be friendly and give advice when you approach. Exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Um, so I think what we'll do then is wrap up with um, one last question. I know I've seen you involved with starting out and helping train and, and form up youngsters, both of your own and, and for um, clients of you guys. What are some things that you actively, um, you know, are mindful of when you have a young dog that you see has potential and you want to bring them out to be the best that they can be? So I think that the main priority would be getting them out. And that's one thing that I really loved about Bruce and Tara when I was just watching them. Um, they bring their puppies everywhere. And so when I finally came, it was just kind of serendipitous timing. I had a puppy that one of their clients actually had gotten. And so I've been there every step of the way growing him up. And it's nice to see as a breeder as well on that side of it, to see one of the young dogs that I put the breeding together, I went and evaluated the puppies and basically picked this puppy out 
mm. with the help of Bruce and, you know, his input, knowing what she's going to want. Sure. And so coming and have bringing him home for her and, you know, raising him up and also, you know, taking the bloodhounds everywhere and working with them. And let me tell you, working with English setters, I think anyone will know is different than working with a bloodhound. <laughs> a bit. <laughs> a little bit. Um, and I never expected to love the bloodhounds as much as I do, but they have changed my life for the better. They are just the oh. best things. And I am just so grateful every day that we just take them everywhere and we treat them like we're, they're our own pets. I love that. And we spoil them rotten. <laughs> yeah, I think that's so great to share too, is that, you know, these dogs that are like working, you know, they live life like, life like normal dogs and normal pets. And I think you guys in particular do a really great job of making that a part of those dogs' lives when they're not in the show ring. I mean, they're our pets. We have to live with them every day. So why not treat yeah. them like, like they deserve to be treated? That's, and that's their philosophy and mine. And I just believe that wholeheartedly that they will be better show dogs if mm. they are treated like pets you know right. sometimes they're pets first right at least with the dogs that we've raised and mm. had with us I love that and I think like as a dog trainer myself I fully agree with that that it's like you can't force a dog to be a star but if they love you and want to do anything for you like that's a dog in their prime element doing what what makes dogs special it's magical. It truly is that. magical. <laughs> well, Maddie, thank you so much for sharing with us um, on the Canine Chronicle TV. We hope your businesses continue to do very well, and hopefully we'll see you soon at some dog shows. Thank you so much, Michael, for having me. My pleasure.